Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, it's me. <laughs> yes, Professor Hamamoto Show on Tube U, September 29th, year 2022. Can you dig it? 3 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. And that, as you might have guessed, is the beautiful coastline of Santa Barbara County, Montecito specifically, for those of you who could recognize it. I don't know if um, civilians are allowed on that stretch of beach, but supposedly there's, there's uh, access to that area. It's a really elite, expensive, um, wealthy zip code, as you might imagine. And that is all to visually introduce you into today's topic, which is going into the colonial, which is really Habsburgian Spanish, right? The House of Habsburg was running Spain at the time, right? One of the great dynasties of, um, of Europe, Western Europe at least, up through Alta California, which I've talked about in a previous show. I think it's like a week ago, two weeks ago. Check out the playlist when I talked about California and the mission system as being the model for this larger new world order system that we're in right now. And of course, this is one of the main reasons why the glitter, glitterati are moving in to this area, this is Santa Barbara. And for those of you who don't know, there's a Santa Barbara city and encompassing Santa Barbara city and, and cities like, I think it's incorporated Montecito, right? Where um, Prince Harry the Nervous and uh, Megan uh, Markle are moving in, right? I think it's in, that's Montecito. That's within the county of Santa Barbara. It's about 100 miles north of Los Angeles, central Los Angeles, which is itself is a city and a county. And I'd say by automobile, depending on the traffic, it's about two hours north of Los Angeles. It's not that much of a distance, but it's a world away from the central city of, of Los Angeles, even though there are pockets of LA, which are very much like, uh, very reminiscent of Montecito, places like Malibu, right by the beach on, on the west side, right? LA is a, is a, uh, just sort of a patchwork of uh, different communities there. So there we have it. We have a uh, Harry and uh, Megan. Of course, the uh, title is um, The Skanky. Secrets of Santa Barbara. And it dawned on me, for those of you who are watching this show from overseas, and I'm getting more international people who want to know what the real America is about, as opposed to some Canadians who are living in Japan, <laughs> like the Corbett Report. What the hell is that? I mean, what is he doing in Japan? I'm sure he has a Japanese wife who does all the uh, language for him. That's usually how uh, the professors work, the ones who are specialists in Japanese history or culture, they have a Japanese woman who does all the the um, the, the linguistic stuff. But he's, he's in Japan. He's, he's Canadian. You know, I'm a fourth generation American and I'm on our side. I'm not part of Five Eyes. All right. So for those of you who are overseas, this is what skanky means. Right. Cheap, dirty, and nasty. Okay, we got you. Got it. some people will say that's sexist or racist or whatever. Uh, I'm no longer working in the academic world, thank goodness, so I don't have to worry about that. Uh, and if you can't hack it, you can't have, handle handle the words. T.S. You know what that stands for, right? Um. Yeah, I I was thinking of doing making the title of this talk instead of the skanky secrets of Santa Barbara, uh, title it when, um, when Harry met skanky, but I thought that would strike a little bit too home and too close to home. And, um, uh, you know, I, I don't really want to uh, pile on to the grief that I'm sure they're experiencing the happy couple. So also California, Habsburg in, and I'm saying Habsburg again, because now we have, the Duchy of Montecito, there, it's the uh, House of uh, Saxe Coburg Gotha that are settling in there. Again, it's this clash of civilizations that we keep 
seeing even to the modern age, right? We're supposed to be a world that, that has been moving towards these uh, democratic uh, Republican forms of not what the large are forms of governance and government. Uh, at least that's what we're told, right? Italy, which for most of its existence has been, you know, a monarchy and run by a number of different uh, very powerful families. And uh, supposedly they've uh, elected, um, well, they have a, set up a new prime minister, Malone. I don't trust her, but at least she's mouthing the words of uh, Republican governments. And the reason I'm laying this out here is because Montecito, Santa Barbara, in, in a larger sense in America at large and globally, has been co controlled by a very small group of people who settled in Montecito back in the late 50s and through the 60s. And no one really talks about them, especially in the independent media area. Certainly, you're not going to get it from Salem Media because they come off the same branch, which has the Christian evangelical audience tied down. That's really what their function is, to like suck the oxygen out of that particular little uh, vessel there, right? And then you got them for the liberals, which I'll talk about here, the liberal globalists. There's a liberal globalist. There's the evangelical globalist. There are, there are all these different groups that, that have that think that they're against each other, but they're controlled by the same bloodlines that go back to um, uh, these larger um, European bloodlines, as, as I've already mentioned, right? And um, I'll get to that um, in a moment here, but I just, like I usually do, I'd like to interject uh, autobiographical elements into my talk. I've been around so long, I've <laughs> I find myself sort of like Zillig, right, or... Uh, Who's that Tom Hanks character, right? Life is a box of chocolates. Said my life is real. It's not a movie by Bob Zemeckis, right? I grew up in Los Angeles. My father bought a vacant lot, which he built apartments on in central Los Angeles. I already told you my dad was an entrepreneur. He was, he's total Nice, which second generation, total gangster, right? Which I'll get to in the end, but we're going gangster by the end of this. That's why I brought the... Urban Dictionary, we're going to get funky. We're going to get skanky, right? Because um, that's the way the world works. You didn't make up the rule. I didn't make the rule. We were born into this world as it is, as imperfect as it is. All right? So anyway, stay to the end because I got a big surprise for you. Um, And and it's it's a valid uh, it's going to sound crazy, but it's going to it's going to be completely valid. It's going to be historically consistent with what I'm telling you about right now. So I grew up in L.A. My dad was a gangster. He hung out with gangsters of all different ethnicities, Mexican, Jewish, uh, the Anglo-Saxon, of course. They're the ones that controlled the establishment in the late 50s and 60s. They became more Jewish later on. But the old establishment was like centered in Pasadena. Right, which the Theosophical uh, Society put their national headquarters and um, quarters in Old Pasadena, which has kind of come back lately. It's uh, you know it kind of got run down because the money moved from Old Pasadena. That's where Parsons was, by the way. JPL, all those people, all the the intellectual labor and the money was concentrated in Pat. And you know, there's a reason why Dr. Uh, Roth, David Lee Roth's father, was a successful ophthalmologists there in the Van Halen. They were living in the more working class area of Pasadena. But then the money moved on the west side, where, where it resides right now. That is on the other side of the 4, 405 freeway. And the real money starts moving out to Calabasas, a little bit north, you know, Will Smith. They started bringing in black entertainers. They started integrating the city in large. It was all, I grew up in, in uh, segregation, so I, I saw how how uh, the, the residential patterns change. And of course, then they move up to Ventura County. And then beyond that, the next county up is uh, Santa Barbara. And now they even allow Negroes to live there, right? If you consider, I don't know if she had to turn in her um, her Blackalicious uh, credentials, uh, Oprah Winfrey, 
but uh, she, it, you know, she's one of the more famous um, residents of Montecito, right? Like my people live there, right? We had farms up in that area, but as I told you already, we got moved out in the concentration camps during World War II. We, we were doing agriculture, my people, right? And that's why we don't have anybody mo who, you know, my people who are living in Montecito because our wealth was stolen. It was taken away from us. From people like the Pritzkers, by the way, the Pritzker family who who built this huge hotel chain. You know how that happened? They got all the all the hotels which were segregated, and all the restaurants from Japanese Americans in Los Angeles, and it was given over to one of their inside lawyers uh, as a special master during World War II, and all our our real property got uh, stolen and taken away by people like the Priskers. They're just one of many that we are expropriated. So you, I'm just telling you this because you got to, you know, I think otherwise you'll just think I'm crazy. You got to understand the historical roots of why I have this bad attitude. You dig? And um, I'm also have bad attitude because we're going to talk about higher education, like the University of California in particular, where I was from, right? I, I had a 22 year, 21 career, 21 year career. I got a PhD from the UC system. And um, there's a really luxurious campus in Santa Barbara, which I think we should run a clip for people because you, you're not going to understand the source of my, my aggression and my bad attitude unless you see for yourself visually how these entitled kids, um, well, you know, they're 18, 19. They're not kids. I'm sorry I'm for being ages. You know, I'm a boomer. Okay. Um, let's, let's have a glimpse of how, and this gives you a, an idea of the milieu that, uh, that Harry and Skanky are moving into. Here we go. I'm sorry. We saw that one already. Meghan Markle and Prince Harry have gone exceptionally grand with their California starter house purchasing a $15 million estate in the heart of posh Montecito, the seaside Santa Barbara County enclave that is famously home to a slew of Hollywood heavyweights. The public documents reveal that the Duke and Duchess of Sussex secured a $9.5 million mortgage to acquire the seven-acre compound, which is securely tucked away on a private, gated street. <clears throat> Despite the unquestionably hefty price tag, it could be argued Meghan and Harry scored the property at a discount of sorts. The seller, low-profile Russian businessman Sergei Grishin. <laughs> what did I tell you, gangster? I'm not, okay, Sergei, I'm not implying you're a gangster, but what the hell are you doing there? My people have been living in California for decades, and I'm a fourth generation American. You're a Russian oligarch that shows up in Montecito magically. All right, but hey, that's cool, because by the end of the show, uh, we're going gangster. We're going Asian gangster. All right. Um so that's Montecito. You can see that stuff on your own, so I'm not going to belabor the point. I have been boning up on the royals at war and reading because, you know, we're, we're going through the big drama right now with these so-called royals. They're not my royals, right? They're economic royalists, but they're not my royals. You got Harry. When Harry met Skanky, yeah, that's what's happening. They bought a home from a Russian oligarch. And, you know, um, I've been ranking on him just sort of for fun from show to show, you know, Dr. Todd Grandin. I think it's because I'm jealous. You know, he's got millions of subscribers. He's making bank, you know, but he's he's just kind of a tight ass, very stiff. You can tell he's, he's everything that he's done, you know, he's doing, he's reading it, man, it's scripted for him. But I'm beginning to really <laughs> realize that maybe that's part of his shtick. Shtick is Yiddish for his, his act, you know, his 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 deal, you know, his, his show, right? So yeah, even he's going in on um, Harry and Skanky in his own little uh, sort of tight ass way. And I think it's kind of funny. So Harry is just very, you know, I'm not gonna show all of it, but it's a really interesting intro. Dr. Grande, today's question is, can I analyze the interview with Meghan Markle published in The Cut magazine? This August 2022 article was titled Megan of Montecito. 
Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me. Okay, that's enough of you. You're going to watch it on your own. Um, remember, that I, I stated categorically, never trust a man in a Hawaiian shirt, unless they're in Hawaii. But uh, outside, of, uh, outside of the Hawaiian Islands, you know, Steve Pachanek, doctor, he's also a doctor, and he's a medical doctor, uh, or a Dr. Todd, don't, don't trust people in Hawaiian shirts, um, especially if um, you're, you're buying a used car. All right. Now, I, I mentioned UC Santa Barbara. Right, the you got to check this out. I mean, I take it for granted. I've been there many times, and I know people who teach there. And everybody I know who teaches, oh, I hate living in Isla, Isla Vista's, the residential part of Sandy, uh, Santa Barbara. It's very expensive to live there, Most, and a lot of you know my peers there live in uh, faculty housing, like in Santa Cruz. Um, the college towns, you know, the, the, it makes the real estate blow up, you know, because it's um, and of course, if it's a UC, it's globalist. And it's also sitting in the footprint of the Spanish Habsburgian missionary system. There was a Mission Santa Barbara, which I didn't show you here in this um, in any video evidence of that. But go check it out. It's very beautiful. These these different missions. So here's what uh, life is uh, for your um you see Santa Barbara uh, undergraduate. I chose UC Santa Barbara for the beautiful weather, the top-notch academics, the great athletic program, and the student support of the soccer team. I was choosing between schools uh, that I got in for my major, which was mechanical engineering, uh, and that I could play volleyball in potentially. I love it here, it's, it's awesome, you know. I really like the academic environment here. I feel like here it's very easy to make a study group, and I really like that aspect of UCSB. I chose this school because of the long wanting of like coming to Santa Barbara, especially because like I've seen pictures and like I visited, and I really like. I'm sorry. Okay, you get an idea of the undergraduate population. But here's another example. This is supposedly a day in the life of the average UC Santa Barbara student. And people around the country in the U.S. here and around the world, especially in Asia, because uh, what this clip doesn't show you is that the UCs are mostly dominated by yellow people, both Asian Americans and people from overseas. That's the only that's their 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 cash money. And this is why, and I'll get to this later, this is why they are, uh, UC and, and Yale, you know, Stanford, they're all discriminating against Asian Americans from getting into school because they're out performing. I mean, UC Santa Barbara, it sent them like an almost all white community, but I, probably uh, half of the population is Asian American. So this is not really representative. Um, same with UC, um, you know, we make fun of it. Uh, UCLA is, stands for University of Caucasian Lost Amongst Asians. Uh, UC Irvine is, stands for University of Civics and Integras. That's what Asian gangsters like to drive, right? Civics, Honda Civics. Or it's UCI, we used to say it stands for University of Chinese Immigrants. And this is a national phenomenon right now. And I'm, you're, you're seeing backlash uh, taking place right now. This is why uh, when uh, someone like uh, Alex Jones keeps, you know, uttering or your fear ranger, Michael Adams, uh, are fomenting this sort of sinophobia and chack on this time, it, it makes me, uh, uh, it takes me back to the 1940s, right? When when we have this sort of race baiting going on and it's, it's happening at the institutional level here um, as well. So here's a day in the life of, um, let's see, a a, um, let's see, do I have it here? You feel there is. I'm sorry. There's no combination of words I could put on the back of a postcard. No song that I could sing, but I can try for your heart Our dreams, and they are made out of real things Like a jukebox of photographs with sepia tone loving Love is the answer at least for most of the questions of my heart like 
Why are we here and where do we go? And how come we're so hard? It's not always easy, and sometimes life can be deceiving. I'll tell you one thing. As Okay, then she gets, she catches a few waves, and then she decides decides to go to class. <laughs> oh, she has to get in some swimming, got to do some laps here. Then she decides to go to the, the uh, university library. I don't know what this means. I'm going to go ask a librarian. I just asked a friendly librarian for help, and she said that the book I'm looking for is on the sixth floor. So here we go. <laughs> I found what I was looking for, got three books on the history of French language, and they look really, really uh, dry, but you gotta do what you gotta do at the university. She's back on the water again, right? She had to make a token visit to the uh, university library. So that's a that's life. I'm, I mean, I'm not not typically, but um, uh, and I'm, I'm just playing this because um, you know that's about to end for all the Asian American people, right? Who think that being on that track is going to get them into the um, into the elite? Because as I'll show you in a moment, we're going to go from bikinis just like that, and we're going to go into Yale secret societies, which um, implanted themselves in this area by, I would say, around uh, the 30s, but definitely made it official by 1957, 58, 59, which I'll get to in a moment when I talk about Robert Maynard Hutchins. All right, so we're going to get into some secret societies. No, 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 not skull and bones. You know you know how I, I always start ranking on people who who are telling me like, oh yeah, you got to learn about Skull and Bone. You got to learn about the Rothschilds. You got to read this. I mean, like Jack, I've already read that stuff. I, I'm, I'm not new to the party. I've been doing this stuff for decades. All right. It's new to you. It's not new to me. So just sit in the back of the class and shut up and listen before you, you know, tell me what I need to do. It's called jaw jacking. Right. And um, I was getting a lot of that and the undergraduate popping you know, when I first started teaching, people would, would listen. But by the end, they would go to these counseling sessions and retreats, right, run by the um, the people who dispense pharmaceuticals to undergraduate. And they were telling you how to try to sweat your professor and take control of your own education because we're going to bring in the GLBTQ, BLT, La Raza agenda. And uh, as you can tell, I didn't. I didn't stand for that kind of nonsense. Uh, those people got beat down real quick. Um, all right. Now, as I mentioned, and this is another reason why I have a bad attitude, because, you know, I'm ghetto. Uh, I didn't go to UC Santa Barbara. I didn't go to UC. I, I, I think I was eligible, and I went to Cal State Long Beach. And uh, maybe that's why I have a bad attitude. But that's not really the point here. It was at Cal State Long Beach when I first got an inkling that Santa Barbara was an intellectual center because I was taking this communications course and I was reading a really, because I'm interested in media back then, you know, living in LA, I'm interested in the music scene and, uh, you know, the doors and movies, of course, and all this television stations were the local ones, which I went to, you know, I've been to the tonight show. I've been in tons of those live tapings I was on the Tonight Show the second, the last week that Johnny Carson was ever on. And the second to last night, I was there with my friend, who is the expert on uh, Antonio Gramsci, Professor Carl Bach. <laughs> said, you live in L.A. You got to, you know, this is our industry. And I think it turned him on to, you know, the movies and the whole showbiz thing. But uh, we saw F uh, Farrah Fawcett Majors there. Um, which we'll get to in a moment, hopefully. We'll get to it right now. So anyway, that's when I first really got an inkling that Santa Barbara was just not some place for rich people, which I've been there because, my, like I told you, my dad had taken me up there to to uh, meet with um, his the guy who held the mortgage on his property. Right? He was a very prosperous um, dentist. I guess he had enough money to retire up there. And he was a gentleman farmer, and I have a distinct memory of him as me as a child 
of him being on a tractor, right? Plying up his own land. He was, he was wealthy. And my dad, you know, was struggling. I think, you know, the, the uh, dentist had uh, some uh, great respect for my father because of the hard work he was putting in. Indeed, I'll tell you a good story here. This uh, dentist, this wealthy landowner up in Santa Barbara, um, was was so kind to my family that um, when my dad started making the payments on the interest of the mortgage, he 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 didn't charge him any interest on the property. <laughs> he forgave that. He says, "Okay, you paid for the property. I don't believe in the usury in your case. We're going to forgive that." And um, so, and anyway, it's, I just have a distinct uh, fond memory of of Santa Barbara in that in that fashion. But by that time, by the way, when I'd go up there, Santa Barbara was already the home for a lot of wealthy Midwesterners. A lot of people from Detroit area, you know, from Ohio, you know, the Midwest, uh, but more so from the East Coast, right? The elites there. You had people from LA, you know, by way typically of New York, but you had the Hollywood movie people, you know, mostly producers, some higher end celebrities living there already in the 1950s. And even earlier, uh, during the silent era of movies, I haven't gotten a book yet. I ordered it. I think there were a lot of British expats that were living up there. So Harry and Meghan are not the first ones. I think that area there was really a uh, Anglo-American enclave. A lot of them with occult belief systems, specifically theosophy, right? Which hopefully I'll be able to slightly get into. I mean, there's so much, you know, we just think of Harry and Meghan and you know, when Harry met Skanky and, and Montecito and Oprah Winfrey and maybe uh, uh, Ellen DeGeneres and Portia de Ross, you know, some of these other people. I think Rob Lowe lives there, right? And yeah, he hasn't worked lately. I guess he made some pretty pretty wise investments earlier on. Um, but we think about that, but, but it goes much deeper into the social history. I would say that it goes, as I suspected before, really, really starting to dig in preparation for this this talk here. And I'm going to return to it, and I'm sure in other talks. But it goes right into the heart of the New World Order. All right. Be patient. Watch to the very end. You're not going to be disappointed. You're going to be gobsmacked, as they say in Britain. All right. Skanky, gobsmacked, right? I, I, I cover the entire <laughs> uh, lexicon here. So I got to see what uh, life was. You know, I lived in the ghetto. I lived in, you know, under segregation. I got to also see how the other half lived up in uh, Santa Barbara, California. But I found out, hey, I looked in this booklet. It was about television and democracy. And I grew up on, te- you know, on television. I was the first generation who grew up in front of the lobotomy box, right? You saw the previous uh, talk that I gave that was uh, a little clip from Agency 1980 about putting in subliminals to ch- <laughs> as like a as an unloaded gun for children, right? Robert Mitchum in a great speech. Yes, we need this. We need to. <laughs> That's me. So I looked at this booklet and, you know, as an undergraduate in Cal State Long Beach, while my uh, counterparts up in San- Santa Barbara were we're like hanging out. The campus is right on the beach. It's on the bluffs. I didn't have enough space here, enough memory to put it in. I wanted to show you a drone shot flying into UC Santa Barbara. But I was intending a, I wouldn't call it a, a ghetto university, but it's an urban university. And it was perfectly fine. I'm not resentful at all. I enjoyed it. I, I learned a lot. But I'm just telling you, that's how, that's the unlikely place where I got turned on to the idea, hey, television could be a force for good. And there's actually an institution up in Santa Barbara that seems to be dedicated to using this medium to educate people, to enlighten people, instead of hooking them on Post Toasties and Captain Crack, right? Or Pepsi Cola or See the USA and a Chevrolet. And it's just more, it's, you know, because by that time, by the time I was in the college university, I was beginning to figure out what I had been through so far as being socialized into the endless summer, you know, the Beach Boys. I've talked about this before, the whole supposed counterculture. And the counterculture was already kind of dying out by the time 
I got into college. But when I was going to college, I was looking forward to becoming a hippie. But by the time I got there, it was already beginning to uh, fade out. Um, okay, so you got an idea where I'm coming from. Okay, curiously enough, Santa Barbara started seeping into the national, that is the U.S. national consciousness on television, network television, ABC. There was a show that ran from 1971 to 74, roughly my university years. And it was called Owen Marshall, Counselor at Law, uh, in, at Law, Counselor at Law. All right, we got it. And uh, co-starred Lee Majors. <laughs> and that's what rang the bell. I said, oh, I just did a homage to Lee Majors and with uh, Robert Mitchum on, on, uh, in the agency, which, by the way, I got a copyright strike from the a Canadian company that holds the copyright. I told you it was a Canadian PSYOP deal. I got the notification uh, from uh, Tubu, and uh, they're going to get the they're going to get the monetization of my intellectual war. But that's okay because I only have ten thousand subscribers, uh, whereas uh, Doctor Ted Grandy has like ten million or something. Uh, I wonder who's behind him. Anyway, that's enough. So here's um here's Owen Marshall. Check it out. It's a Santa Barbara milieu, 1971, back in 1971. And I'm sure Oprah, you know, and all, you know, the people around the country. Oh, yeah. Santa Barbara is the place to be. That, by the way, is the actual courthouse in Santa Barbara County. And I didn't mention Farrah Fawcett, and she became Farrah Fawcett Majors later, as you know, right? For those of you who are of my generation, she married Lee Majors, the $6 million man. Hold on. You're in for a treat. I have a little time. He just ran 90 yards with a kickoff return. Yeah, well, sip carefully. This may dissolve the fillings in your teeth. Now, considering that my... Yes, ladies and gentlemen, that might have been the fateful moment when Lee became majors. Lee, may she became a hyphenate, uh, thanks to Owen Marshall, uh, counselor at law. That was Arthur Hill, by the way. I checked out his background and uh, surprise, surprise, he's from Canada. He's Canadian, right? A lot of the, the five eyes people who are masquerading as Americans, you know, I can't get any, I can't get any respect. I'm a fourth generation American, but the Canadian, the five eyes people can walk right into it. They can pass, right? I'm not complaining, but I'm just telling you, you know, why I got a chip on my shoulder. Um, and why it's going to change, you know, hang on, that's, that's about to change. Um, anyway, okay, so now we're going to get serious. There's a guy named John Maynard Hutchins, right? They always got three names. And um, I think he did his undergra undergraduate work at Oberlin College in Ohio. He's a Midwestern dude, right? And uh, he comes from a long line. I think it goes back to colonial times, but I think it comes from a, a line of educators and uh, ministers, right? And Oberlin, if you didn't know, was one of those um, colleges that were abolitionists, right? And they were on that circuit, by the way. You know, Harriet Tubman and the Underground uh, Railroad, or railway. It's kind of like a, a point from uh, south to north for um, slaves, enslaved human beings to uh, to escape uh, that system. So I'm saying that because he has a liberal, civil rights, pro-humanist, Christian um, politics, right? But does that necessarily mean that he's not New World Order? No. 
we have to be a little bit more subtle when we're when we're talking about these characters and what they represent at the institutions that they found and manage and also direct into creating social policy, legislation, and also condition the entire political culture. This is what someone like a, a John Dewey before John Maynard or Robert uh, Hutchins did. You know, the, all these these characters and, and who's behind them? There, there are these bloodlines like the Rockefellers, like the Ford family who are funding these individuals. Right. Um, and I tried to make the similar point by but using a different example with Salem, Salem Media Group with Dinesh D'Souza and uh, the bloviator, Dr. Sebastian uh, Gorka, who's a newbie. He's a new American, and he's telling me, a fourth-generation American, what to think. And I reject anything that comes out of his bloviating mouth. Right? And you got Larry Elder, who's a, you know, a little bit more palatable to me. And even, um, I mean, these guys have been around for, for decades and decades. But this other guy, what's his name? Charlie, what's his face? 28 years old. And um, he's on uh, Salem Media. Um, they don't have any standing with, or any credibility with me. The point is, is that I'm trying to establish the fact that it's not black and white. We have to be more nuanced in our understanding and our approach to these people because we're going to be continually whipsawed and shock and awed and nothing's going to change because we think, to borrow the term, the favorite term of the opposition, we human beings tend to think in black and white or binary, right? So yeah, Dinesh D'Souza says something nasty about the Dem Oh, good. He's got to be good. Or, you know, pick your name of the Salem Media stable who have sucked all the oxygen out of the, they've got the Christian demographic, uh, Christian evangelical demographic. They've got them sewn up tight, right? Same, And so Hutchins got the liberal Right, the liberal Democrats sewn up as well, and uh, this is the this was published in 1981. Um, thank you, Petra and people. You allow me to acquire these books, which aren't easy or cheap to to find. But I need to to get the text. I need to get the book, um, and it's by Fred uh, Frank Kelly, 1981. Court of Reason, Robert Hutchins, and the Fund for the Republic. That was the original term for this nut, this money that, that Hutchins was administering ostensibly to fight against McCarthyism, right? And that was also kind of, it was, as we're learning now, was kind of a fake show there. It was a whipsaw. You know what a whipsaw is? It's a two-man saw. And it's like working at cross purposes sometimes, or it's trying to hold two different contradictory motions um uh, at the same time, right? That's what I mean by buying. That's why I'm talking about whipsaw as a psychology that um, that the advertising people know very well and uh, and they understand, they know how to manipulate it. So, um, and I think what, what uh, David, I calls it what the, the controlled opposition or the fake dialect. I mean, you could use whatever term you want, right? I call it whip being whipsawed, me mentally whipsawed. Uh, you don't know up for down anymore, black and white. And uh, that's that's a basic of, of um, what we call mind control. I don't like to use that term because it's so overused. But that's one of the staples of, of, um, of mass persuasion, manipulation, mind control, whatever you want to call it. However, Hutchins and his ilk are highly educated individuals, right? They have um, postgraduate degrees. And in the case of Robert Maynard Hutchins himself, he was appointed the president of the University of Chicago, at the tender age of nine, of 30 years old. This is Robert Maynard Hutchins. University, and of course, University of Chicago wasn't what it is today when he was president, but it was still a major institution. And those of you who are in the in the chat room here, and by the way, feel free to uh, to uh, talk smack about Harry and Skanky all you want, you know. That's that's why I kind of led with that, because um, I think the best way to do with them is not to really take them seriously. Just look at them as a sort of a, a real time, prime time soap opera. Right. That's really why they were sent over here to be uh, distractions uh, from the real work that's being done by 
by uh, the movers and shakers at uh, in the city of London, right? You know that. What better place than Montecito? So that's uh, uh, Robert um, Maynard Hutchins, comes from this liberal Christian background, right? Educator, uh, University of Chicago. But those of you in the chat room and have done your homework and are at a certain level of, of, of having done background reading, know that University of Chicago is what? It's a Rockefeller institution, right? It's no accident. The continuity of agenda, right, we see, because that's where Michelle Obama, the next president of the United States, that was, that's where she, where she built her power base, right? along with the synthetic president, Barack Hussein Obama, has U University of Chicago ties. It's all Rockefeller. And Rockefeller is, is uh, Heinz Kissinger. He was a Rockefeller errand boy from going back. Hutchins was a Rockefeller errand boy. He was the president of the U University of Chicago for over 20 years. I think it was like 21, 22. Let's just say 20 years. And, all right, there's more. It's like the Ginsu knife. That's all you You will only allow me on TV as Mr. fucking Miyagi or to sell your Ginsu knives. Right. I want to be Dr. Todd Grandy. I want to be a U2 celebrity. Anyway, that's enough self-promotion for now. <laughs> so where did uh, John, um, not, not John Maynard Keynes, but Robert Maynard Hutchins, where did he go after he left in disguise? Because I guess he didn't get his way totally at, uh, or he played himself out, right? Or he thought he was going to be a president instead of a Rockefeller tool. He left the University of Chicago and guess where he touched down next? Yes, the Ford Foundation. Are you beginning to see a pattern here? <laughs> yeah, I think you are. By the way, I, I spoke on the phone. This is how important I am, right? I live this stuff. I'm, you know, I've been around so much. It just sort of falls into my, into my lap. But I, I talked to a, uh, the, the, the outgoing president of Brown University. His name is Vartan Gregorian. Armenian. Check him out if you think I'm lying. He called me up at home. This is when I was UC Davis. He called me at home. I don't know. I got my home phone, home phone number. I don't give it to nobody. So Vartan Gregorian, and he was leaving Brown University to head the Ford Foundation, right? But he just wanted a letter of recommendation from me to some guy, I'm not going to give his name, who was trying to get tenure at Brown. So I wrote the letter and you know, blah, blah. The guy did get tenure and, you know, we never heard from him again. So anyway, just another one of those weird anecdotes. Um, you know, these, these weird uh, <laughs> occurrences in my strange life here. So he goes to the Ford Foundation and he butts head and eventually, uh, I don't think he got any money from the, well, he got the Rockefeller, right, uh, money through his University of Chicago, who also funded, as you know, our friend at the University of um, of Illinois, right, uh, the pervert, right, Kinsey, Alfred Kinsey. And then he went to the Ford Foundation. But then he got a notion. I don't know who put the bug in his ear. I don't know if it's an original. It might be an original idea. And Robert Hutchins said, we're going to start a, a fund, that hence fund, for the Republic, which is going to be a counterbalance to what we're seeing is creeping totalitarianism, right? McCarthyism that's putting the, uh, the, the, the lid on free inquiry, which I, you know, I, I subscribe to that. That's why I was really entranced by this, you know, the Center for Democratic Institutions, Santa Barbara, California, that I read when I was in Cal State Long Beach, right? Because the Fund for the Republic later changed its name and it became the Center for Democratic Institutions based in Santa Barbara, California, starting, I think, in 1959. I'll look in this book here and give you the exact um, citations here. Um, I won't belabor the point here, but I have it bookmarked. Thank you very much, Patreon people. I'll just read you this one short passage. From uh, Hutchins himself, says, quoting, we should look forward to a residential center composed of men who will devote their whole time to the program for considerable periods. This is for the Republic, right? Anti non-Marxist, non-communist, non-socialist solutions to McCarthyism in society. 
Men who are interested and qualified, but who cannot look upon their connection with the program as a primary obligation, should be regarded as critics and not be expected to initiate or direct the work. Okay, so they're going to be consultants. And guess what? It says, our full-time group, I'll, I'll be done in a moment, should move out of New York City at the earliest opportunity. This is the intellectual capital back then, right? Even today, it's shifting slightly, but it's still the place, right? Our present location is not adapted to the kind of work we are trying to do. Freedom from distraction at a low rent is now more important than easy availability for apl to applicants for funds. So he goes on, he tries to do a, um, you know, sort of a, um, a business proposal here. And to conclude, he says, uh, this is the author writing now, says, Hutchins had a place in mind, although he did not specify it in his statement. He had a small house and 26 acres in the hills above Santa Barbara, California. He already had, a, he had already moved there for health reasons. His wife had some, some health issues as well. He planned to build a home there for his final years of life. He was 60 years old when he was proposing the Fund for the Republic and the Center for Democratic Institutions. And to conclude this passage here, it says, he thought that Santa Barbara would be the ideal location for the fund's residential center. And that's how I came to, as an undergraduate, read about this incredible center where democratic principles were being worked out in my area of television and media. So I definitely had it in my mind that this was, this was, this was the place to be. And uh, by the way, um, you know, we've, cause we've heard all about Tavistock. Oh, and oh, that was a, you know, yeah, it's true, but there are other centers. And well, and this is one that I want to put into play here. So will you forever and forevermore talk about the Center for Democratic Institutions now and add that to your catalog, which consists of one institution only? Tavistock, 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 right? Or cultural Marxism. No, that's much more vast than that. And by the way, uh, I think what I'm contributing here is 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 very practical because I, I think most people underestimate the extensiveness of the system that, that they think that they'd be able to um, reform by just electing a Ron DeSantis or a Georgina Milano or whoever else is out, you know, or a legislation, you know, we're going to, we're going to change the law or we're going to go back to, um, you know, Glass-Steagall, right? It's not going to be that simple. Because these people have invested decades and decades, if not in generations and generations, of time, money, effort, intellectual effort, and resources to to establish themselves, to burrow real deeply in into the republic, and they've done it in the guise of, you know, evangelical Christianity. You pick your religion, Roman Catholicism. You pick your religion, Judaism, Reform. Could be Chabad Lubavitch. You know, whatever it is, or could be liberal, democratic, you know, Hutchinsonian type of uh, Republican, you know, thought. They've got the whole, and I'm talking about the, they meaning the blood eyes, have the entire spectrum covered. So there's a lot of work involved. But I told you before we leave here, I'm going to, I'm going to leave you with a uh, proposal here because there's a solution. And um, it's tongue in cheek, but there's there's <laughs> someone might, who's watching this might take me up on it. That'd be great. Okay, so let's listen uh, from the man himself, um, just very briefly. His voice, this wonder kid of higher education. He's really the guy. He was also involved with the great books, by the way, and also one of the reasons why he moved to Santa Barbara. I told you it was a Theosophical center. Right. And I have figures and names and people who help Senate move it from Point Loma down to San Diego area. Right. The Andy Besant, Madame Blavatsky people, they're Luciferians. They, they, they moved to Pasadena, but they also had a very, and still have a very strong operation up in Santa Barbara. These are your theosophical society. But Hutchins was also very much taken in with the Huxley and Aldous Huxley, the perennialism, the perennial philosophy that as all religions are the same, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, it all comes of the same source of the divine. 
Does that sound Freemasonic or not? Right? They're not all the same. But perennial philosophy was one of the reasons why they moved out of New York and come to San Diego, because it was fertile ground for that. The ground had already been plowed by this theosophical people. And you know that all the wealthy people that are moving in there now are coming out of out of that Luciferian bag as well. You understand? That's their world. So here's a little bit of Hutchins. Of, he, of course, he's not going to say, you know, I'm I'm a perennial philosopher. He's talking. He's going to speak in these sort of humanistic lingo that we just love to hear. Danger of thought control or political control in our schools if Fed. I am for federal aid to education. Let me start with Do you question. feel there is any danger of thought control or political control in our schools if federal aid to education is increased? The answer to this question is no. I am for federal aid to education. I am for federal aid. So you get to hear his voice. I'm running out of time. I've got to move on. Of course, I think this is probably in the early 60s. Of course, as he's been proven wrong. Federal aid and the takeover, when he thinks federal, it's really more like a Pentagon takeover, Pentagon slash NATO. Uh, this is where the GLBTQ, the Antifa, all the, all the nonsense that we've seen, over, and also the biocontrol, it, it's almost complete now. Right. So that's why it's kind of pathetic and sad to see all this, the shiny, happy people at uh, UC Santa Barbara who think they're going to surf their way into the new millennium unmolested. They have they're clueless on what the, what they're surfing into. So, OK, let's get a little bit more specific about who Robert Maynard Hutchins is. And let's also expand our our idea of what secret societies are, because, again, Aren't you tired by now of hearing, oh, skull and bones, skull and bones, all the dumb, blah, 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 right? That's only one secret society at Yale alone. And they and they usually masquerade as literary societies anyway. And there have been movies made about it. But has anybody here in the chat room heard about Wolf's Head? No, I don't think so. But that is where Robert Maynard Hutchins comes from, right? And they're on the same par, the same level as Skull and Bones. But again, Annie Jacobson has just steered us into one little crevasse called Skull and Bones, Skull and Bones, Order of Death. So here it is. It's a little, here's um, Maynard Hutchins. This is his secret society at Yale. He, from Oberlin, he went to Yale. A wolf's head. And if you don't believe me, this comes from your most authoritative source by, uh, what's his name? Uh, Jimmy Wales right? A Wikipedia, Yale University. Check it out yourself. And here's their old tomb. There's the old tomb, the original tomb, Gothic. Ooh. And here's a little bit later with, it's got a little bit of ivy growing on it. And here's the, the newer tomb, which was, uh, I think, built in 1924. This is a close-up view. It's still there. And here's a more distant view. That's the tomb of the Wolf's Head Secret Society. That is Richard, I'm sorry, Robert Hutchins <laughs> Milieu. By the way, this is the first Asian uh, who graduated from an American, a U.S. university. His name's Jung Wing. He graduated from Yale in 1954. This is before the American Civil War. And the reason I put him in is because now they're beginning, they being the bloodlines, right? It used to be Jews who were discriminated uh, at the Ivy League. So they had to build their own institutions called Brandeis University because they're saying there are too many Jews coming into the Ivy League. This is like, you know, the great Gatsby, you know, the white shoe boys who were the Congregationists and the Presbyterian, you know, the, what later were called WASP. They didn't like Jews coming and taking over. And now it's Jews who are part of the establishment who are discriminating against Asian Americans, right? No one understands the historical irony of that. Professor Hamamoto does, because that's my world. 
right? And Professor Hamamoto is not going to stand for that either, because Professor Hamamoto's people were already expropriated by the Pritzker family, and we're not going to be expropriated again. So I'm bringing up Jung Wing. He was kicked out of the country because of the Oriental Exclusion Act and the whole generation of Chinese and, and Asians and Japanese, too, after 1924 were not even allowed in the country. But he was the first guy, and he was brought in by a Protestant missionary who had gone to China on behalf of the Yale Yankee wasp establishment to, to start to colonize their minds before they can take over the country. And they were doing it to Japan as well. There are a lot of Christians in, 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 in China. There's a lot of Christians in Japan as well. You might be surprised because you grew up watching uh, Quentin Tarantino or Mr. Miyagi, you know, that kind of stuff. You watch Bonanza and you think all Chinamen are obscene, you know, and you think they're, they're those cowboys, they're all Canadians and they're all Jewish. <laughs> they own the Ponderosa and you got Hop Singh there. Okay, but but you don't know about um, Jung Wing. Okay, so why am I belaboring this point? You, you think it's just a matter of ethnic pride? Not at all, you know, because there are a lot of scummy uh, Chinese and Asian, Vietnamese and I met a lot of them myself, Koreans, right? I mean, you name it. You, you name the, the racial group, the ethnic group, the, wherever they're from, there's always a very healthy quotient. You know, Russians, Ukraine, you, you know, scum, all right? So that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm just talking about, you know, I want a piece of the pie here, and you're not going to cut me out again. You got rid of me from UC Davis because I was telling the truth. Right. I was trying to warn everybody, not just the Asian American. I said, we're into going to a bio, um, a bio uh, spheric tyranny here, you know, and all you Asians who are going into pharmacy and doctors and, and to computer science information, you're just going in there as coolie labor to help make, uh, you know, uh, Bill Gates and uh, all these other characters, Jeff Bezos and uh, you know, these South African um, five eyes, you're just making them wealthy. And as soon as that infrastructure is built up, you're, they're going to get rid of you, just like Yung Wing, just like the coolies who built up California as it was industrial. Well, you know about the railroads, right? So here's my solution. Okay, since we're, we're you know, the yellows are being excluded from the profession, they're cutting off the pipeline at the university. You know, there's no more SAT, by the way. There's no more scholastic aptitude test. There's no more, um, they don't care about advanced placement. They don't care about academic or intellectual excellence anymore at these research one institutions, right? So that's why, and and, they're, and this is all part of the the taking down of, uh, of America in general. They're cutting off the intellectual vibrancy that was brought in by this Asian American population over the past 30, 40 years. Uh, and instead, they're going to bring in the, the children of illegal immigrants, right, who have no preparation or, or people, you know, working class, which, you know, it's fine. That's OK. But isn't it everybody who wants wants to have a go at it? So here's my solution. Um. Just like the Congregationalists, the, the Presbyterians, and I mentioned Brandeis University, founded by Jews. U, USC was founded by uh, a Christian, a Jew, and someone, because they were excluded from these, these East Coast elite institutions. So they found their instance, own institutions, um, Baptist colleges and whatnot. So I said, hey, that's a great idea. There's historical precedent for it. So I'm going to do the, the same. I'm going to propose the same model. And my fund, I'm not going to call it the, the uh, Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions. My think tank is going to, and it's going to be in Montecito, by the way. And it's going to be built on an estate in Montecito that's owned, shadow owned by Chinese gangsters, triads, or Japanese yakuza, who put celebrities in there to live there, right? Actors, Hollywood actors, they don't have the money. Do you think, do you think Ellen DeGener uh, DeGeneres has that kind of money where she can buy a succession? No, she's a front for some people. But, you know, if a Chinaman shows up in Montecito, it's going to be pretty obvious, right? Or Japanese, East Asian, especially since we're under suspicion continually going back to 
you know, the Chinese Civil War and, you know, communism and World War II and all that, right? That's why you can have uh, Dinesh D'Souza or, you know, Filipinos, you know, Michelle Malkin, but never any East Asians. So I'm going to say I'm going to hit those people up and, and put an institution on the property in Montecito, and we'll call it uh, the Center for um, for Democratic Gangsterism, all right? And uh, we're going to build our own university right on the property in Montecito, not far from UC Santa Barbara. And um, the university is going to be called FU University, right? This is how it's pronounced. I'm sorry. Here's a millennialist, right? That's where Hutchins was coming from. Here it is. Let's catch it very quickly. There's one of these restaurants. There are many restaurants wherever you, whoever's watching here, you are living near a pho restaurant. You think it's pronounced pho, but it's pronounced pho. And go in there. The food's really good. I went to Da Nang and I got the real thing. I got to sit on little plastic chairs and eat pho every single day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So you can do it here in America. And the reason I'm mentioning that, because that network of pho restaurants all over the country is also going to be funneling in students and resources to my university. It's called Pho University, or in the case of all the people that are, are excluding Asian Americans from Harvard, Yale, and Stanford, for you, I'll give you the sh abbreviated version of my, by, by the way, I'm nominating myself as the inaugural chancellor of Pho University, but for short, for all you people, the chancellors and presidents of the committee of the University of California, Stanford, Yale, uh, Cornell University, this is going to be the name of my institution. It's called Fu U. You got it? And that's Fu U to the New World Order. So this is how you pronounce it. Ever had fall? Yes, it's fall, not fo. After the Vietnam War in 1975, many people fled the country and they built their community and reserved the culture by cooking pho. And that's why you see there are a lot of southern pho in the US, Canada, and other countries. Nowadays, pho is known worldwide and is a beauty of many cultures and historical stories. There you go. The U.S. military, the CIA, Operation Popeye, right? You know about all the biotoxins uh, that were done. There are more bombs dropped on Cambodia and Laos and Vietnam than there in the totality of World War II against Germany, right? That was, and then South Vietnam as well. They were, they were, they were our allies, by the way. Tons of bomb, literally. You know, General West, Westmoreland, you saw the, the talk I gave earlier on. So, you know, those children are here now the descendants they're here they're making and now they're being excluded from the university so i've got the solution and i'll leave you with that ladies and gentlemen <laughs> yeah i never thought i'd be able to say it on two view but fa you establishment fa you alex jones fa you the fear ranger fa you dr sebastian gorka fa you salem media group fa you university of california regents fa you sherry lansing and your husband uh, william friedkin who directed the exorcist fa all of you all right <laughs> oh man i'm hungry i think i'm gonna go get some fa thank you ladies and gentlemen thank you for tolerating my rant bye